Thank you very much. Okay, um, a nice uh, Rupert presentation, which is more conceptual. My is more an empirical one. Um, as a matter of fact, it is my first-hand experience talking about um, the role of civil society organizations in setting agenda, public agenda, and uh, building a consensus uh, among uh, citizens through deliberations uh, using the case of umbrella movement, particularly the mobilization process before the movement. Uh, let me give you a little background about the uh, political structures in Hong Kong. Uh, in our parliament, what we call Legislative Council, only half of the uh, Legislative Council is elected by people directly. For the other half, uh, they are elected through functional constituency, mainly Chamber of Commerce and also some professional groups like lawyers, uh, doctors, engineers, so uh, only half of them are directly elected people, by people. The other half are by these kind of functional groups. And um, for our, our, our chief executive, that, that, that is our president, which is elected through a election committee, which is constituted by only 1,200 people. We have seven, 7 million people in Hong Kong. So only 1,200 people are eligible to vote. I'm one of them. But I'm still very unhappy about this system. For these 1,200 people, some of them, around one-fourth of them, are elected through some um, professional group, like professor, medical doctors. But the franchise is very limited. It's only around uh, 300,000 people. So uh, it is really what we call a small circle election in Hong Kong. So that's why people are very unhappy about the system. Um, well, after many rounds of movement, Beijing already uh, laid down a schedule for reform of our system. Uh, according to the decision by the National People Congress in China, uh, they promised that by 2017, well, we have already passed, right? Uh, we could have a universal suffrage or direct election of the chief executive. Uh, if it succeeded, then by 2020, we could also have universal suffrage of the whole uh, legislative council. That is the timetable laid down by China. Um, because of this timetable, um, the um, different wings in the democracy movement have a lot of conflict regarding whether we should respect this timetable or not. In 2010, we have a very serious split among the, the, the Democrats, whether we should respect this timetable. Because uh, by that time, we were talking about the reform in the Legislative Council, which is going to be um, implemented in 2012. So two years beforehand, we started the debate about this. Uh, one group of people, uh, what, what they, call, they call themselves radical, they believe that we should take away this functional constituency immediately. But there, are an, there, was, there was another more moderate wing. They believe that we should respect this timetable. So we should just have some incremental reform in uh, that year, in 2012. And so they started to negotiate with Beijing. And if, as you can see, I'm one of these you know, uh, moderate uh, Democrat negotiating with Beijing. And at the end, uh, our proposal was accepted by Beijing by expanding the franchise of the functional constituency. But we create very serious infighting within the movement. So this is the background. Um, now look at it. Um, after the negotiation, the, the moderate Democrat were attacked by uh, young people, by some citizen, and some uh, party member of the Democratic Party, which is the uh, largest uh, oppositional party. They have some member who uh, uh, quit the party and form another new party. So the, the speed was so serious. So uh, in 2013, uh, Professor Benny Tai, me, and Reverend Chu uh, started a new movement called OCLP in order to create a new platform for the oppositional party and the CSO to work together uh, to you know, tackle the coming uh, new round of constitutional reform. Uh, I still remember that in the first uh, press conference, we did it in a church. 
and we asked the reporter to take picture with the cross, with a cross as a background, because we started to talk about civil disobedience. We want something peaceful, but very confrontational. And we believe that this Christian faith is important for us to frame our movement, to communicate to the public that we are really committed to a non-violent struggle. So that's why we held the first press conference in the church. In fact, we learned from the Poland's you know, solidarity. They always have press conference in the church. You know? They were protected in the church. So this, that's why we have this first press conference. And then we invite uh, some of the uh, important people in town to support our movement uh, in order to create an image that we are non-partitions, we don't have personal in interests, we don't invite those you know, politicians or major political leaders. Instead, we invite people, say for example from a uh, teacher union, uh, we have a writer, a very famous novel writer, we have a church leader, uh, a lawyer, and also we have several uh, people from the business community. Uh, this one is a a uh, famous investment banker, and he is also a founder of a uh, media group. But later on, these people from the uh, business sector have to quit the movement because of some personal threat to their business partner or to their, to their own safety. So later on, they, they all retreat from, from the movement because of this personal threat. In fact, I received a pile of life-threatening letters with razor braid in it, some of them, so it's uh, a common business at that, mo at that moment uh, during the mobilization process. Um, okay, what we, what we need to do at that moment is uh, agenda setting uh, to, to, um, to, to create um, an agenda in the public to talk about uh, universal suffrage. We need to build consensus after the split. Uh, we, we, need, we need to sit a sit mandate from the people because we want to negotiate with Beijing again but we learn from the past mistake that we need a political process to build consensus among people and to get mandate from the people. So this is what we have to do. And civil society, civil disobedience, that is to occupy a space to protest is only our last resort. We have a four-step uh, approach, that is uh, to deliberate, that is to build consensus, uh, referendum to get mandate from the people, and then negotiation, and then civil disobedience as our last resource, re resort. Um, but the government refused to talk about political reform by that moment, 2013. Uh, the chief executive believed that we should spend time to talk about housing, economic development, nothing about e political reform. And uh, China, one of the major uh, officials responsible for Hong Kong uh, affairs, uh, once again, repeated that uh, anyone uh, who is going to run the election must be patriotic. They must love the country, uh, but we understand the idea of love the country means love the party, you know, obedient to the party. So this is uh, how they respond uh, to our movement. Uh, well, then we started to, you know, uh, mobilize uh, different means to do the agenda setting. We were very much inspired by uh, Habermas, his historical study of public sphere, his idea of ideal speech situations. Uh, but it's, uh, I guess it's uh, Ackermans and uh, Fiskin who really provide a structures, uh, what he called deliberation, deliberation day or deliberation poll, in order to make this um, deliberate democracy uh, something uh, really uh, practical. So we learned so much from Habermas philosophy as well as from the book, The Liberation Day. So the first thing we did is to create several deliberation day for people to gather to talk, gather to talk about democracy, universal suffrage, talk about our movement. Um, so this is something really new in Hong Kong. No one really heard about it beforehand. So first we have uh, the first deliberation day uh, held in uh, Hong Kong University. Uh, around 600 people, uh, they are mainly active members from oppositional parties and civil society group to participate. First, we have a plenary section that, uh, well, before the deliberation day, we will uh, post uh, different articles supporting democracy or against democracy on the website. So all the participants could check different viewpoints from the website before they join the deliberation day. 
And in the deliberation day, the first part is a plenary section. Then everybody will join, and then we will show the video, uh, showing them different viewpoint about universal suffrage, uh, about the reforms uh, of our system. And then we will have a break-up section that around 15 people in each group that people can start to talk. Uh, everybody will be assigned equal time, no matter you are party head or regular citizen, you will have equal time. And we have, before the uh, direction day, we train a group of moderators. These moderators, some of them are professional. They are doing um, mediation work in, in town. Uh, some of them are just, uh, uh, you know, uh, university students. We train them to moderate this group to make sure that no one will dominate uh, the whole discussion. So we have a very strict rule for people to have equal time to discuss. And at the end, we'll have a conclusion. Well, it was a very successful event. It drew a lot of attention from the public because it's something really new. When we don't have democracy, we talk about democrat, uh, deliberated democracy. So it's something really new and draw a lot of attention from media. But uh, we also found that many people find it very threatening to have a discussion of this kind, particularly those people with working class background. They keep their mouth shut. They, they think that it's so difficult for them to express themselves. It's a little bit better in a small group, but in a plenary section, it's quite threatening to these people. So in the second deliberation day, we decided to create a series of town meetings, a series of town meetings in different corners of society. Now, look at this picture. We have, we have of course, we have meeting with those people like, like this are from business community. They are investment banker in Central. Um, we have uh, some leftist group, radical group, they're socialists. We have a uh, deliberation day with uh, college students, churchgoers, and we also have a deliberation day with homeless. You know, so we have a deliberation day under a footbridge so that uh, social worker will help us, you know, to gather the homeless around that community to talk about the meaning of democracy to them, whether they want direct democracy or not. For the third uh, deliberation day, uh, we turn it somehow like uh, uh, elections. That um, we, we solicit around 15 reform proposal in town, and after two deliberations, it spent more than nine months, and then we ask people in the last deliberation day to pick three of them out of these 15 uh, proposals. Uh, all these 15 proposals, according to our expert, we invite a group of international experts to vet them beforehand, saying make sure that they will meet international standards, which means that they are going to provide an open and free election to Hong Kong people. And, but people in this deliberation day, will then at the end, will choose three proposals, uh, for, and then we will put forward these three proposals uh, for people to choose. Well, we only have 3,000 people joining this deliberation day, but we are going to organize a referendum, a people referendum. So that's why we need to sort three proposals first. Well, in this last deliberation day, there's a lot of debate, and then we, again, we experience a split among the democracy movement. Some young people, radical group, they insist that all the proposals must have an element of public nomination or civil nomination, which is like a Taiwan model, that regular system, regular citizen can nominate a candidate for the elections. So um, like 5% or 3% of the voters, then you can nominate someone. But uh, according to basic law, all the, no all the candidates must be nominated by a nominating committee. So apparently it is against our small institution of small constitution. So there's a lot of debate uh, within the democracy movement. Um, so the students insist that there must be a public nomination, but some like uh, Anshin Chen, who is one of the very high uh, ranking official, he, he was a former uh, high ranking official in Hong Kong government. He also joined our movement. Uh, according to his view, we should strictly abide by the constitution. So we shouldn't have you know, public nomination. So a lot of debate, and it's, it's almost like a split. Um, I will explain more why the, the, the outcome of the deliberation day is not what we expect. It seems that people are polarized after the deliberation instead of reaching a consensus. 
Well, then we have to rely on the referendum to resolve this problem. In Hong Kong, we don't have any provision of referendum in our law. So the government is not allowed to organize any referendum. So we have to organize the people referendum, civil referendum. So this is the last scale civil referendum, first time in Hong Kong history. So uh, we, before the, the referendum, we spent seven days, day and night, walking around, hiking around Hong Kong to promote this civil referendum. And uh, Cardinal Chen, who is the highest ranking uh, Catholic church leader, who, who became the spiritual leader that brings different uh, factions together in the movement to join this march, to ask to promote uh, the referendum, ask people to come out to vote. Uh, but before uh, we were able to launch civil referendum, our system experienced an unprecedented attack from the hackers. And this is a picture showing where, uh, where these hackers were from. You, you find that they are from different parts of the world. In fact, according to the company, they knew, they knew that it was manipulated by some government-backed hackers. They used different computers in the world to attack our system. They never experienced this level of attack before. So all the company in Hong Kong, computer company, computer security company, they all withdraw. They all quit. They said, we don't, we, didn't, we don't have resources to protect your system. And luckily, at the end, we got a uh, American system, uh, uh, com uh, computer system called Cloudflare that they, 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 they were committed to protect our system. So after days of working and, and just five minutes before we start the referendum, the system worked again. Uh, they, they put all the resources in saving the system. Well, we understood that if they quit, in fact, Google will, will join us. So that's why they, they have to compete, you know. Uh, anyway, um, it was a very move, moving uh, moment uh, because uh, everybody expected the, the system couldn't work. But at the end, uh, the system was safe and everybody was in tears during the march. Uh, so um, most people, in fact, vote for an electronic system through the e-platform in their mobile phone. Most of them vote through mobile phone. So we, we ask a company to write a software so that everybody can vote through the mobile phone. But we need a lot of checking to make sure that it won't be duplicated. You know, people cannot vote twice. You know, so we have to send back a call and so on and so forth. It's a very complicated system. Um, at the end, we have 800,000 people vote in this civil referendum. In Hong Kong, even if it is a government organized election, the maximum number will be 1.5 million. But we got half the voters joining us through this civil referendum. And many people, they were so afraid the hacker might change uh, their vote, they will rather go, they will rather go physically to some uh, polling station set up in churches, social service organization, NGO, community groups. So we set up different voting booth in different, you know, CSO, you know, offices, so that people could go to this, you know, different school, community service group to vote. Well, it was a very successful, I would say, um, 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 uh, actions. But at the same time, uh, we, we witnessed the development of a counter movement in town, you know. Uh, as I mentioned, we start the movement from a church because Benny Time is a, Professor Benny Tai is a very devoted Christian. Reverend Ju is a very devoted Baptist church leader. So we also experience a counter movement first from the church. Now, so we, 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 there are some, you know, uh, church leaders, particularly from the evangelical, you know, traditions and also the Anglican church. They, uh, they believe that um, Democracy is not a panacea to a social problem. And they think that breaking law is also again Christian faith. So when you ask people to join a civil disobedient action, it's against Christian faith in their view. So uh, the church is also, was also split uh, regarding our movement. And then there is a organization called Silent Majority was established by a group of business people and scholars 
when we you know, ask people from business community, professional community to support us, at the same time, we have this counter movement with similar you know, uh, constituents of this, this move, movement. Um, so they are also civil society group, uh, but they don't believe in democracy. You know. um, they even attack it as being violence and anti-democracy. Um, so these are the another group of civil society organization, if, if, if you may call them. Um, and at the end, uh, in, in late uh, August 19, uh, 2014, uh, Beijing made a decision that um, people in Hong Kong would be given one person, one vote in 2017 election. But the candidates must be screened by the nominating committee with very limited franchise and restrictive procedures that basically exclude the oppositional party from joining the election. So it's a kind of fake democracy. Now we've got a lot of the illiberal, I would say the kind of illiberal democracy. Now we have a lot of things like this now in, in the world, Singapore, Russia, that you have election, but at the same time, you don't need, you, you don't, they don't allow real competitions uh, in elections. So after the announcement of Beijing decision, then uh, we have a lot of protests. We, we shape our head as a, as, a, as a sign to protest against these decisions. Uh, we have uh, candlelight, uh, we have re, uh, uh, rallies, we have a, uh, a march, people carrying banner, talking about civil disobedience, class boycott, condemning uh, Beijing for breaking promise, and so on and so forth. And students also started to have their own action. Now, they have uh, the class boycott in late uh, September. So this is the uh, a pictures of the class boycott uh, organized in my university, in the Chinese University of Hong Kong. So uh, different university students came over to our campus to demonstrate. We're talking about um, 100,000, I forgot. This is a big number uh, that people, you, you can see. Um, they have a class boycott, and then later on, we also have high school students. They also have class boycott for almost one week. We have this class boycott. First, we have college students, and then we have high school students. And at the end of the uh, boycott, they storm the government headquarters to reclaim a space I don't have time to talk about this space. It's so important about the space of protest. During the colonial period, um, in fact, we were so difficult to find a space to protest against the government. You know, in front of the government headquarters, usually they build, if we have a square, usually we, they will build fountains, plant a lot of trees, so that they can kill this public space that we couldn't, you know, protest. And um, even uh, the China Liaison Office, they have the same practice that to kill this public space. And so after the, the boycott, they stormed the government headquarters because there is a space there. In the past, uh, people were allowed to demonstrate. But later on, the government found it too threatening. So they encircled it, a building fence, they encircled it. So this student cried over the fence and to reclaim this space. So because of this, it triggered the whole umbrella movement. So you see the crackdown. I have already shown you the video, so I don't need to talk too much. Um, many people who study uh, umbrella movement saying that it is a leaderless movement. It's a connective movement, not collective. Connective movement or network movement. Because uh, we are talking about 1.2 million people joining the 79 day of occupation. No one could really organize such a big scale you know, um, demonstration. We rely so much on me, social media, new media, you know, to spread the news, to uh, mobilize people. So people believe that, well, this is a leaderless movement, people joining it spontaneously. But uh, if you look at uh, my presentation, you know that um, it's, it's more than this, you know. Um, yes, it's a, 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 a movement with very strong um, citizen initiative. You will see that, you know, anyone who has a microphone, they can set up their own forum. Uh, there's a lot of sharing, uh, food, and also they work together for some uh, art creations. Um, 
It's also a movement that emphasizes so much on sustainability. Uh, we, they build up a recycling system immediately in the first day of the occupations. And there's a lot of art, you know, creations. You know, um, they, they build up, you know, barricade uh, to protect the protester. And the most impressive thing is that they also build a study for the high school students to prepare for the examination. The examination was coming, so that's why some people then build a study for this student, high school student, to study day after day, day, day and night. And uh, in order to, you know, to make it sustainable, they also use human, you know, the, the, the bicycle, the human, human bicycle to generate energy uh, for the, the study. So they have a power from these human, you know, uh, generator, power generators, you know. So it is a very spontaneous movement, a lot of citizen, you know, uh, initiative. But if you look at my presentation, you will know that, in fact, before the occupation for this 79 day, there was a long process of mobilization. We are talking about one and a half year that uh, civil society organization uh, were play, play a very important role in agenda setting and also uh, in building consensus among uh, pro-democracy citizens. Uh, in the first early stage of the movement, this uh, CSO also were responsible for manage the occupied uh, site uh, because it lasts for 79 days. There are lots of routine logistic support that, that we needed. So CSO also provide very important support in the management of this uh, space. Uh, only because uh, the movement prolonged too long, uh, that at the end, uh, people became very impatient. And so uh, they refused to you know, accept any leadership. So at the later stage of the movement, it was really like a leaderless movement. Uh, but if we look at the whole process, including the mobilization process, then it shouldn't just uh, regard it as a leaderless movement, uh, se agenda setting. And also, you know, deliberation is were also very important part of the movement. Thank you very much, and uh, Q and A is time. Thank you.